Hi guys and welcome back to the Academy of Historical Fencing. I'm Nick Thomas. And I'm Esther Gibson. On uh, Wednesday of this week I posted up a video asking for your questions on British military swords and swordsmanship and I said on the weekend I would respond to them. Now we ended up with about uh, 55 um, individual questions once I'd taken away duplications. Um, I have changed the wordage of some of those questions because some of them got quite long and rambling and, and had to be simplified. So I have simplified some of the questions um, and yeah, I have taken out anything that is not on topic because this is specifically British military swords and swordsmanship in the Napoleonic or just pre-Napoleonic as well period. So anyway, um, Esther's now going to be reading off the questions and I'm going to provide my answers to the best of my uh, knowledge and hopefully we'll all have a bit of fun. So uh, take it away. So, first up, how common were duels with swords during the Napoleonic period? So, um, dueling by this time was you know, essentially illegal in, in many places, most places, um, so it shouldn't be happening. Um, and the other thing is that by the late 18th century, the pistol had become far more common for dueling, especially in Britain. So, um, in France, the sword was still a bit more popular, and uh, in dueling uh, works of the, of the late 18th century, there are... Um, descriptions and advice on how uh, British uh, people going over to France shouldn't take these duels because the French are basically waiting for them in ports to just slaughter them. So the general trend is they shouldn't be happening. The duels that are happening are more likely to be pistol duels. Um, and yet um, there are some notes of, uh, of duels going on and particularly of, um, of British officers winning them by essentially not abiding by the so essentially the code of conduct and just barreling through and smashing their opponents to pieces. So um, they happened, but we really don't exactly know how common. And certainly the pistol, as far as the British were concerned, was more the dueling weapon by that time. Okay. So given that the HEMA community are prone to fads and fashions, what were the fads and fashions of the Napoleonic British army in terms of swords and swordsmanship? Um, at a basic level, the hussar fashion took over massively, the really flamboyant hussar fashion that you see in uh, Austria, Poland, Hungary. Uh, which is about the uniforms and the swords and it, that's where you end up with these wildly curved um, uh, sabres and stuff like that and that really caught on on the British army, it had a huge influence uh, and, and specifically in terms of swords even more extreme than that so a typical um, sort of Polish, Hungarian, Austrian sabre at that time might have a curve on the blade of something like five or six centimetres and that's quite a lot uh, but another fashion trend that really took hold is um, during the uh, campaign in Egypt in, in 1801 the um, uh, the basically Mamluk um, sabers of of the of the of Egypt really caught people's imagination and they got copied. Now those are what we would normally call a shamshir. So this is a British-made sword with a British hilt, but it has a shamshir-inspired blade, and that means it has no fuller um, and a usually wild curve. So this is a 10 centimeter curved blade. So this is an example, a really good example of how um, fashion trends really came into play. In, in the period uh, and um, so that's a, a non-regulation late 18th century or early 19th century infantry sword and that is actually an 1803 official regulation sword that also has a crazy Shamshir inspired or Mamluk inspired blade so that's another good example um, and one more I'd give you is um, uh, Gordon, Major Gordon's methods of bayonet combat so um, in terms of being in combat, it's pretty typical to have the, the, the right hand, the lead hand, just before the trigger, um, and the other hand here. And that's the typical way of using bayonets um, through a lot of different methods. But Gordon um, wanted to have the hand on the back here and use it for reach and also for parrying cuts from cavalry like this. And he also encouraged a um, left foot forward um, uh, sorry, uh, sorry. Um, being this on the left side as opposed to typically on the right. So you think you normally fire with the right and you keep using it on the right. So that was an interesting method. And the reason it's a fad um, is because it only caught on, as far as we know, with some specific militia and yeomanry units and stuff like that. It's not yeomanry, but militia and volunteers. Um, and it doesn't seem to be representative of what followed on afterwards when you look at St. Angelo's bayonet exercise. So there's a few good uh, fads and fashions. Just on that note, with um, a particularly curved blade, uh, as with the bayonet using it in different ways, would it affect um, a soldier's capability to use a sabre? Because the British system is very linear. Yeah, this is something we did find, is that when you get these wildly curved blades, 
Um, they're not at all suited to the British methods. It doesn't mean they're bad by any means, but the peoples using these blades tended to um, get in close, use a lot of passing footwork and use a lot of close range cuts. And that's completely opposed to the British methods of lunging and using reach, using point work and stuff like that. So they really don't suit the British method and yet they were really fashionable. Also fashionable among the French as well. It wasn't just the British who really got into using these Shamshire inspired blades. Um, and even uh, both Wellington and Bonaparte had swords of that ilk as well. Okay. okay. So what are the injury risks in practicing sabre and how do we prevent them? Yeah, so um, the risks in sabre, I mean, there's always the usual human risks that you've got to take into, you know, into account, having good masks and back of the hair protectors, all that kind of stuff, good jackets. What else? Um, well, if you do um, kind of like stirrup hilted sabre stuff like this, where it's quite open, the, the thumb is a huge vulnerability, which when you use a ball hilt sabre, it is really well protected. So um, the thumb is especially vulnerable, more so than most sabre styles, when you're using stirrup hilts and similar. Uh, and as a result, get tip protectors in there or use a glove that has full crush protection. And that means not just protection on the top of the thumb, but on the sides that provide um, structural support. And things like the Spez fingertip protectors go really well into a red dragon glove and they sort the problem. Now, red dragon gloves aren't the perfect glove for this sword, but they are the best of what we've got for this right now. Um, what other injuries? We do a lot of rotational movements. Uh, we do a lot of lunges. So your knees are going to get a lot of work. Your, uh, your um, wrist and your elbow, even though it's not an elbow driven system. Um, but uh, just if you are getting pains in it, put one of those sort of sleeve wraps on it. I find they're really good. Use them once every couple of years if I have any tweaks or pains there. And um, that's about it. I mean, you know, lunging your knees, just make sure you've got good form. Go back to my lunge video and, uh, and work through your lunging form. Make sure that's, that's working well. Um, I think that's probably about it in terms of sabre or military swordsmanship specific. Yeah. Okay, so did the British develop much of their own sword play, or did they mostly copy the rest of Europe? Yeah, so uh, swordsmanship throughout Europe is a generally um, uh, a sort of um, a throw together. You see it all the time of different masters travelling around the, um, the whole of Europe and elsewhere and learning from others and bringing it back and deciding what they want to do and kind of doing a hot pot sort of mix up. So um, it's not just uh, Britain that did that. Um, we don't have many early British sources. I mean, there are obviously a few early longsword sources, and then there's George Silver and Swetnam and stuff like that. And you can see uh, the sort of stuff progressing through that is familiar at that point. Um, so it does seem that there were British methods. And yet we know that the uh, Italians had huge influence in the 16th century. The French had a, a major influence from the late 17th onwards. Uh, and then you get uh, things like the Hungarian, Austrian things being mentioned in the 18th. So I would say, yes, Britain developed its own methods, and yet, um, borrowed and merged with all kinds of other things that were being brought in, which is essentially what you know a lot of other countries were doing anyway. So sort of yes and no. <laughs> okay, so what kind of types of swords and cutlasses were used in the New Zealand wars, and were they trained to fight against native weapons, for example, a Zulu warrior with a spear and shield, or and other non-European peoples? So that's um, definitely past the early. 19th century period because that's into 1840s onwards um, so it's it's past my main field of interest but I do still have some knowledge um, of British swords and swordsmanship that goes on from that um, so yeah I won't go so much into the patterns um, but what were they using um, well I know they used a lot of uh, essentially mounted infantry using cavalry type swords um, at that, that point and you can have various hangers as well um, artillery hangers and stuff like that but um the, the, the question that is really more interesting, I think, there for this subject is, were British soldiers being taught to, um, to, to fight against different nations in different styles? So yeah, were we being taught, not we, were they being taught to fight, say, Zulu warriors and things like that? Um, as far as I've seen, no. Um, the methods were universal methods taught at home and abroad, and uh, anything that evolved to fight a specific enemy, I think, from what I've seen, would be developed um, in the field, and, and that's certainly something I've seen when you go to, say, the Sudan, when they were adopting uh, spears to, to fight the, uh, the troops that were lying down on the ground, stuff like that. I think um, stuff happened at a unit level, possibly, uh, with certain interactions, and we know that certain British officers did train with locals and things like that. Um, so, on an army-wide level, army level, no, I don't think so. Um, on an individual unit level, 
possibly. Okay. So I'm developing a game set in England, 1780. I have struggled finding information on this matter in specifics, for example, swords, as 1780 predates the first British service sword of uh, 1796. I'm wondering what swords would be used and how common each sword was, both by the military and by civilians. Okay, so um, the first um, infantry pattern was actually before that. So the 1796 uh, is the sort of double shell guard one. But before that, there was an early regulation, and that's the 1786, which is um, this. Uh, but when I say this, it can vary a lot more because um, the 1786 regulation was just a blade regulation. It didn't mention anything about the hilt aside from its colour. So you can see all sorts of variations. Um, and also, even though it was the 1786 um, uh, uh, regulation, it essentially was a standardization of a lot of things that were already in place. So you will see swords like this in the 1770s, for example. So they just looked at what was already in use and regulated it to some degree with the blade. So in the 1770s and 1780s, you'd see a lot of stuff like this, this spadroon. Um, but you'll also see quite a few other swords. So throughout most of the 18th century, officers could just choose their own swords. Um, sometimes the units had to have the same sword, but Still, it could be vastly different from one unit to another. So um, a common sword for an officer to carry um, pre the regulations would be something like this. So this is a, an infantry um, hanger, so, so a small sabre, if you like. Um, and it's kind of 1760s to 1770s into the 1780s, so sort of you know, American Revolutionary War period. So this is quite typical of what um, British Army and Navy officers were using at that time. But they could have all sorts. So um, small swords were really common for army and navy officers in that period as well. Uh, they did phase out mostly in the Napoleonic period, but certainly 1780 and before, small swords were really popular. Um, some basket hilts, although you know it's thought of by that point as a, a as a Highland or a dragoon weapon, but um, but some basket hilts. Uh, in terms of proportions, oh, in terms of civilian civilian swords by that time would usually only be small swords. Um, and they were phasing out at a rapid rate um, because of fashion and the handiness of uh, small firearms. But um, yeah, in terms of proportions, it's very hard to say, but an officer would likely have some kind of spadroon hanger um, or um, small sword uh, at that point, and a civilian would only have a small sword if they had anything. That's, that's the likely scenario. So, what is your favourite weapon and pattern of weapon in the British military swordsmanship system? Yeah, um, actually there's some awesome ones, but um, my favourite has always been the 1803, which is the first official regulation uh, infantry officer's sabre. And um, my favourite example of it is this one. So I've got three, and I've currently got a fourth one, that Shamshir one, uh, that I'm currently uh, looking after for um, Alex Simon of Kraken Swords. He'll get it at some point. But yeah, this is my absolute favourite one. Um, the 1803 varies wildly because there was no blade regulation, so the hilts are there, these slot hilts, very sexy um, uh, uh, hilts with the GR logo, and you see this one has a grenade, so it's a, a grenadier's sword, um, used by flank officers, so that's your light infantry officers and uh, grenadiers and stuff like that, also by uh, rifle officers, and uh, some line, line infantry officers did carry them in lieu of um, spadroons when actually going into combat as well. So they were used more than just by the flank officers. And this one is especially nice because it's a, a, good, a good sort of medium length, 81 centimetre blade. It's, it's agile and yet it has a lot of cutting power. It's basically like if you took a light cavalry sabre and made it sexier and better suited to combat on foot. So I just, I just dig it. It's awesome. Uh, there you go. Always been my favourite, even though I love spadroons, love brown broadswords and that kind of thing. But the 1803 is just fabulous. Cool. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, what is your favourite period anecdote of British military swordsmanship in use? You know, that one is a tough one because there actually are some awesome ones. There are so many awesome ones. Um, and one that I actually really love, and it's not even a feat of skill necessarily, but of survival and, uh, uh, and survival in, in, uh, against adversity, is during the uh, siege of um, uh, Ciudad Rodrigo in uh, Spain. And um, a lieutenant, a British lieutenant, got uh, separated from his unit and attacked by a Frenchman with a uh, musket and bayonet and it started by the, um, the Frenchman shooting him in the thigh uh, and then rushing him with the bayonet and uh, he parried it but not well enough and the bayonet went into his uh, thigh. I don't know if it's the same thigh that got shot, it's not recorded. So he took both a musket ball and a, a bayonet thrust in, in 
one or other side. Um, and they got to then to the close and, and ended up grappling uh, quite a desperate struggle until the uh, British officer managed to throw him off uh, and deliver an immensely powerful cut down to his head, which just caved the skull and left brain tissue on the blade. Um, but the, the blade was a, described as an, uh, an ill-made, very heavy Portuguese sword, so a good example of buying swords locally and not particularly good ones, and it doubled over from the impact. So uh, really brutal, um, a desperate struggle and, and quite fascinating, and he did survive it as well. So uh, that's quite an interesting one. So during a big siege, just one officer with a, a badly made sword coming up against a, a single infantryman with a, with a musket and bayonet. So that's just a really cool account, but there are lots more. But we have to take, make another video about that. Okay, okay so um, slightly different topic. Who is the best fencer that you have ever faced? You know, that's actually a really, really hard one because different people, uh, different opponents present way different uh, challenges. So it's really, really difficult. But still the one that I find um, the hardest that I've ever fought is actually uh, a chap who started the club with us uh, called John. And uh, he was a, a very, very good sport fencer and did lo loads of other martial arts uh, and started the uh, club with us. In fact, started us, started uh, when we did it in 1996 onwards. It's before we even had Huma manuals. Um, so, um, yeah, why was he so good? He didn't have an, ama an amazing um, repertoire or set of skills. What he had was basics done to perfection. So his lunge was just epic. Um, he wasn't leaping and bounding around. He could just launch from the back foot with an incredible lunge, covering a lot of distance um, and in a very stable way. Um, and it was lightning fast, and he would always set it up with incredibly fast feints. So, yeah, it wasn't to do with uh, a massive repertoire. He was just exceptional at what he did there, and he could hit you in guard an awful lot. Um, if you get him on the back foot, it was a different story, but I think that's probably the best. And over the years, I fought him for 20 years, um, and, yeah, I think he's been the most challenging, which is quite fascinating. Um, do you have any concerns about the direction that British military swordsmanship is going? You know, it's been a generally a very positive experience. Um, there's a lot more interest, there's a lot of better gear, and um, it's been going very, very well, so I don't want to complain too much. Um, but any concerns? My main concern, really, is basically deviating too far from um, the source material and... Um, the context and reason of why it was being done. So a perfect example of this is to look at uh, Olympic fencing today. Um, they have evolved what they do to an incredible level of essentially a gymnastic level of, of, of art. And it is epic in its own right. Um, but there's a tendency to um, go the same way with HEMA and assume that we can basically improve uh, and make better on what is in the manuals. And um, even though that might technically be true, um, we're deviating so far from what was being done and why. And um, to give you a good example of that, in Roth's manual, he um, explains, for example, the lunge and says, don't over lunge uh, because you can't safely recover, recover from it in a real fight because a fight doesn't end with a point scored. Um, and that most contests of actual real fights don't happen in, you know, with basically perfect footing. So he does actually say that um, this occurs with people that fight a lot uh, on uh, basically essentially gym floors using chalked slippers, which essentially is a lot like using um, you know modern fencing shoes in a in a gym. Uh, it's much the same problem. So he is describing exactly the problem you will have if you follow um, that path that sport fencing has, which is absolutely not a problem for sport fencing because that's what they do. Um, but if you follow the same path for pursuing, say, British military swordsmanship, you're going to deviate a long way from what was being taught and why. So, yeah. Okay. So, this one's an, another question of someone's account. It's, I've recently started using a black fencer 1796 sabre, which at first felt very different in the hand compared to my academy sabre, with a straighter blade and heavier at the hilt. I'm curious in your experience how, how you would tailor your fencing to the geometry of the sabre, or if there are any techniques and or specific treaties that are more practical with a specific type of sabre? So this is absolutely ideal um, uh, for looking at Roeth, because Roeth is for all 
cut and thrust swords when used on foot. Absolutely all of them, from, you know, hanger, cutlass, cavalry swords, the whole lot. Um, and he does describe how the methods can change slightly depending on what you have. And that those factors are how enclosed the hilt is, how agile the blade is, how much curve the blade has, and he describes all of that. So it's a universal system, so you can use all the methods for all the swords, but um, some things are better suited to, to one than the other. So, for example, if you had a um, fairly heavy sabre, um, you wouldn't be gripping it with a handshake or thumbs up, you'd be gripping it with a more enclosed grip, one to row us. Uh, and also, your, when you cut, your recoveries will be done by a rotational movement, as I showed recently on the uh, Hema at Home lessons. Whereas if you had a spadroon, for example, it's got a lot less mass, um, you can stop in front uh, and recover straight to guard rather than using the rotational recoveries. So that's a good example. Um, and also the, the curved blade in the thrusting section uses the curvature to work around people's guards. So that's another way that, um, that, that it changes. As well as the fact of um, when you have heavier hilts, once again, there there's tends to be less mass in the blade, so you can stop them more in front of you rather than twirling them around. And also, when you've got a really um, well-covered hilt, you can go into the medium guards and be protected when you can't work the stirrup. So those are some good examples. But yeah, it mostly comes down to um, mass in the blade and curvature on the thrust is, is the two, two major factors. Um, was there any difference in swordsmanship for cavalry swords on foot versus normal infantry officer sabre? That goes right back to the last question. Um, it's, it's, the system is universal. In fact, when Roth was first published, when he was talking about sabre, he was almost certainly talking about cavalry sabres because the infantry sabres weren't that common at that time. They were carried against regulation. So he's probably talking about cavalry sabres, um, in which case he's covering everything from the Scots broadsword to cavalry sabres to spadrons and infantry hangers. Um, and the methods uh, deviate, again, mostly down to how much mass is in the blade for your recoveries and uh, from your cutting um, uh, drills. So that's the main difference. So, no, the system is the same. So could you discuss in detail the technique of the lunge in historical fencing? In modern sport fencing, the lunge is often taught as starting with a kick or with a front leg into the air. Is it applicable or beneficial for historical fencing? And more generally, how applicable ben or beneficial is the modern sport fencing footwork for something like Georgian Sabre? Yeah, um, I have already discussed a little bit about the sport fencing lunge in that previous question. Um, and to describe some of the more of the mechanics of the lunge, I'll need to do another video. Now, I did recently do a lunge video on um, Hema at Home and talked through that, and there's a good bit of the mechanics in that, but there's more I could say. So I think I will do another video on, on the lunge and include some more of the details, like, um, you know, which part of the foot you land on, do you kick, and that kind of thing. Uh, but in short, um, no, we don't do the kick launch. And um, the sport fencing lunge has evolved into what it is today because of the context of what they're doing. Good footwear, good flooring, um, and uh, of course a focus on scoring points and not on the art of defence as something like Roa for military swordsmanship is designed for. Would I um, say it's applicable to what we do? I would absolutely avoid it in what we do. I would maybe um, look to some of the training mechanics of what sport fencing is doing because they have evolved what they're doing into something quite exceptional. Um, so maybe look at their training methods um, but, but not their techniques uh, because Again, it depends what you want to do. Is your aim to win a tournament, in which case you would be best off going to introduce your sport fencing footwork because that's going to be well suited to it. It's built for it. Tournament fighting on, on good ground um, in, in, uh, in, with modern footwear. If you're trying to study and understand British military swordsmanship with the sources as it was done at the time, no, I, I, would, um, I would avoid it. Um, but we should all work on our footwork, all of us in HEMA, a lot more because Sport Fencing dedicates an immense amount of time to it and they become very good at their method of it. So, um, yeah, I think there's a lot to learn from them in, in methods but, but not in techniques. So, when performing a cut two, um, from, uh, from up left to down right for a right handed um, person, keeping the hilt in front seems to be impossible without overextending both the wrist and the elbow joints, making it susceptible to injuries during the cut or long term, is there some trick that I'm missing here? Cut two. Yes. 
Um, so cut two, it does tend to strain um, the wrist and the elbow. See, when we do a cut seven, it's easy to just throw it straight like this. And when we do cut two, yeah, I know what you mean. It does tend to strain the, the elbow and the wrist a little bit, especially the elbow. Um, so normally I wouldn't throw it completely straight like this, like I would a seven. When I throw a two, I would throw it on a slight angle like this. Now, you're not gonna hit the target as quickly as doing it straight, but I find it a lot more comfortable. I find the guard stays in a bit more of a protected area. The important thing is, is that you're not bending at the elbow. So you can, you can essentially adjust the wrist position slightly and you can move the shoulder through the cut a little bit. So if you're actually cutting through your target like this, that's fine. Um, but yeah, maybe look at not trying to get the full extension like we would in a seven. Just bend the elbow a little bit and carry the cut through on a little bit on the shoulder. Um, so, you know, as a rule, we try and keep the hand out and rotate around the wrist. Um, but you can use the shoulder in some of your actions as well. The important thing is to not expose the elbow or lose reach by bending the elbow. Uh, and I think that's the best thing. Okay. So, can you clearly explain how the methods of Highland, and Hun Highland broadsword masters like McGregor and Sir William Hope evolve, and were they adopted into the military sabre techniques of, of the like of Andrew, Angelo, Roweth and Taylor? Yeah, so um, there's a tendency to see a difference, um, basically the Highland methods and then the British military methods. But ultimately it's just, it's just a lineage. Um, and as far as we can tell, that's the way it worked, is the methods were being taught across Britain um, back in, say, Hope's time. It, was, it seems to have been standard across Britain. Uh, how much is individually Scottish, we, we don't entirely know. Um, but the methods do seem to be uh, you know, generally British. Um, widely used throughout Britain and um, yeah you see that lineage going from the sort of uh, the late 17th century ranging up to the Napoleonic period and they well, they, are in a, they are in a lineage so there's so much in common what tends to happen is um, the circular traverse footwork becomes less significant um, and there's less time put on to certain grappling techniques I would say um, if you look at the Napoleonic stuff, the Napoleonic is slightly simplified and I don't think there's any surprise to that because it's, it's about teaching troops um, quickly to use this stuff and not, you know, in a fencing cell, you know, day after day or week after week. So um, they're slightly simplified, but it's, it's absolutely the same lineage. So it wasn't as such that they adopted it in. It was the standard methods used for throughout Britain. So it's, you know, it's just that it got written down and documented as this is this is now the, the official, well it wasn't even official with Roth uh, and the early Angelo stuff, but yeah, eventually this is the official military stuff, but it was already the broadsword material way back. What what makes you more interested in Roth then, if it's all kind of of a similar lineage? Is it the time period, or is it the style? It's, it's two reasons. Is uh, I love the Napoleonic period especially, so I want to work from something that's Napoleonic and military. And two, I think, of the texts written in the Napoleonic period, Roth is by far the best. I mean, there aren't that many anyway on um, combat on foot, but um, I think Roth is well laid out, well illustrated. I think it's a simple and effective system that has, has always suited um, what I like to do and the swords I like to use. Um, do you have an opinion on the grip direction of a sabre, so straight versus canted? It seems to me that the canted grip has all the advantages with more comfort and a safer wrist position in both cut and thrust. However, during the 19th century, the grips of British sabres were getting more and more straight. Why is this? And what are the advantages of the straight grip over the canted one? Because I can only see its disadvantages. Yeah, um, so canted grips are something that really came into play in the Napoleonic period and it was all about um, extremely curved blades because the more curve you put, I should use one of these, um, the more curve that you put on a blade, the more it takes the point off line, uh, which means that it's not so good for thrusting or the, the thrust that were done in this method anyway. Um, and your cut will land uh, slower than a straight blade. Whereas when you canter grip, which means you bend the tang section here so that the grip points forward slightly, it brings the point on line. So it allows you to have a, a well-curved blade without the disadvantages or most of the disadvantages that a well-curved blade has. So it's, it's a good method for a curved blade. Um, why did it, did it get straighter in the late 19th century? Well, this is supposed to be about Napoleonic stuff, but we are talking about canter grip, so it's related. And I would say, look back to the Napoleonic period for the answers, and I don't think canted grips are that important, um, or even that necessary for straight or quite straight blades. 
Um, and, and in fact, I think the advantages of canted grip are all in offence. So yes, you, it's easier to land certain point work, um, your cuts will land a bit quicker, but in terms of defence, I've always found a curved blade to naturally curve into me to provide nice defence. And when I've used straight blades or canted grips, um, they of course point away in the opposite direction. and They just don't get the defence in the same way, and it's same on the inside and outside guard. Is if I see for my inside guard here with a canted grip, it'll point off that way as opposed to curling around and giving a nice protection. And that's actually one of the things I've really enjoyed using quite well curved blades, is I tend to find they curve into my guard positions and give me a bit of extra protection. So, yeah, I just don't think when you get straight or almost straight savers, uh, a canter grip is all that useful. And in, in a, and generally speaking, in terms of the well curved stuff, um, it, it's useful for yeah the offense, but it does compromise the defense. So something like this with a I think it's four point five centimeters of curve, I don't think you need any cant at all. Once you get to about six centimeters, I think it's in, it's important. But yeah, with low levels of of uh, curvature, I don't think cant is is all that great. And it's a personal thing, but I don't think it's that necessary when you get straight blades. Okay. So how skilled would the average officer have been at sword play? Mm. Um, we have absolutely no idea. Um, the Napoleonic period is early, early days for British swordsmanship in terms of regulated and um, in terms of uh, their usage and also their type. So they're really early days. Um, the swords varied immensely. The training methods were not official. So Roeth and Angelo initially, they weren't official training methods. They were recommended by certain military personnel, certain military works at the time, but they were not the official recognized methods. There were no officially recognized methods at that time for, um, for teaching swordsmanship. Um, and so it was down to the individual unit. So one officer might have fantastic level training with a broadsword master and one may have none at all. Of course the majority of officers were gentlemen and fencing was immensely popular. Uh, broadsword and screwdriver methods were taught in civilian life as well. There were loads of masters uh, and instructors in all kinds of cities around uh, the United Kingdom teaching these methods for money just as uh, HEMA, practitioner, uh, HEMA instructors do today. So. Um, Somebody might be very well skilled and prize fighting was still, you know, a big deal. Um, and someone else might be completely useless. And we really don't have much of an idea. Uh, by the end of the Napoleonic period, uh, literally within months, um, Angelo was in France teaching um, the troops. And that was becoming official and they were getting uh, six week courses where they trained six days a week um, for I believe it, it was something like six hours of training six days a week for six weeks so they would really be blitzed in it but you know that's right after the end of the wars so how skilled were they before that we don't know it was very much dependent on who was in charge um, so it hugely varied and then certainly in terms of the accounts of combat the skill level definitely seems to be varied as well so we really don't know but they were, I would say a whole, a whole mix as you would expect so knowing of the disdain many modern soldiers have for their equipment um, and the amount of equipment they carry, um, did many officers of this period actually want to wear their swords or would they just abandon them if they had to, you know, give them a chance? Uh, so generally speaking, no. Uh, the sword was absolutely vital to their equipment, not just as a weapon. I mean, they did need it for self-defense, um, but it's a symbol of their, um, their rank, their authority, even just to use as a, you know, a pointing stick. Uh, quite literally, um, and uh, as a rule, no, it would it would be valuable. It would be um, uh, yeah a symbol of of rank and authority. Um, there is an exception to that rule, and if you look to the accounts of uh, Cavalry Mercer, who was a, um, a horse cavalry officer, very famously at uh, Waterloo, he complained about the um, the squadron, the infantry officer's sword at the time, and just said that you know it was junk. And in fact. He is the one that everybody brings up when they criticise the Spadroon, so it's, it's always his account. And he says that when they were away from camp, they just carried dirks, so, um, you know, a, a dagger, instead of the Spadroon. Uh, that is the only account I've ever seen of that. It would not be normal from anything I've ever read. So no, absolutely, they would not ditch their swords. They were expensive, they were valuable, and fashion meant everything to British officers in the Napoleonic period. 
that all the 18 questions? Okay, so yeah, we're going to break this up into blocks of uh, 18 questions per video, so you're going to get three videos. That was part one. I'm not doing these questions in any particular order, we're just working through all the stuff that was relevant. So uh, anyway, I do hope you enjoyed the video, and uh, I'll see you in the next one. See ya.